We have Matt Caruso with us today. Matt is a professional investor. He's from Montreal, Canada. He is a former market maker. He's a former university finance professor, as well as a past president of the Canadian Society of Technical Analysts. In 2020, Matt entered the US Investing Championships and he finished in the top five with an amazing return of 346%. In 2021, recently, Matt has launched his Active Growth Investor course to educate investors about how to achieve long-term success in the market. And that's at the site carusoinsights.com. It's an excellent course. It's a very, very comprehensive approach, and I encourage you to check it out. Matt is married. He has two wonderful young boys. He grew up in Canada. He had the passion for the markets um, when he was very young. And he actually uh, made his first purchase of a stock when he was seven years old. And it was Wendy's, symbol W-E-N. And he wanted that stock because he loved the Hamburgs. His obsession started to really take off at age 15. And he first read Bill's book, How to Make Money in Stocks. From that moment forward, Matt really, really had a passion for the markets that continues today. So I'd like to welcome Matt Caruso. Thank you so much for having me on, John, and everybody. It's a great event, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. OK, so I'll just share my screen uh, here. Perfect. Okay, so I want to begin today um, and cover the idea of using institutional mindset with a can slim system. So a lot of us go about looking to use chart patterns, we're looking at fundamental data. And I think most of us here are, are experienced with the teachings of William O'Neill. And a lot of what he talks about is that these large institutions are what drive stock prices. Now, they're also, in my opinion, what create all of these chart patterns and why all of these things look the way they look on the chart. I remember when I first started investing when I went professionally at the, the bank here in Canada, I was in the market making department. There was, I was seated next to one of the older gentlemen who was you know, much more experienced than I was. And I was really deep into technical analysis and charting. And I was, you know, we, were, we were making markets a lot on some of the smaller cap stocks. I was a newer guy, so I wasn't given exactly the, uh, the large caps to take care of. And uh, I was looking at the chart and I said, you know, we, we, you know, we can't buy here, you know, there's whatever, there was, a, there's a resistance point. And he said, yeah, he's like, okay, let's look at your chart. He, he set up an order and he launched an order and he broke the chart. He's like, there, your chart's changed. I changed your chart for you. And so that kind of really put me in a position to stop and think like, whoa, wait a second. These charts are, are not just these lines on a chart. These charts are really representing the demand and supply. And that's why you get these false signals. And, and, and there's no perfect indicator that you're going to find that, you know, some squiggly line is always going to say this is the exact perfect point to buy. It's really you want to always be assessing what's the demand, what's the supply, and how can that allow me to determine if I should be buying or selling along with the different market participants. So before I got into all the different little patterns and, and different aspects, I wanted to kind of start this off um, with having you think about a certain task. So assume you're assigned to purchase a million shares of stock. How would you react under different market conditions? So your job details, you have a million shares of a young, we'll call it an upstart company with only 34 million shares in float. The stock trades only 500,000 shares a day. You have two months to complete your purchase and you're benchmarked against VWAP. So basically you can't just go out and buy at any price. You know, they're, they're gonna be measuring how well you do against the average price traded during that period. So you can't just pay up and, and, and pay the top tick. And when you stop and put yourself in different people's shoes, and that's what I always try and do, every pattern I use is designed for, I have already logically thought about why it works that way. And Bill does that in his book as well. He explains why the handle and the cup and handle is there and why the shakeout plus three works the way it does, et cetera. But if you stop and you try and go through this process and you try and put yourself, especially in the shoes of larger institutions where they have the difficult task of moving around monumental amounts of money, it really starts to open up to you exactly what's going on in the marketplace. Now, as individual investors or, or you know, uh, people managing less significant money, it's, it's so much easier to move in and out of the market. Uh, I mean, I, I, even when I was making markets at the bank, it, you know, with smaller cap stocks, so I had often a big percentage of the, of the average daily volume, and you really have to be careful. You can't just get out when your stop is hit. You have to work your order, 
And so these funds buy these huge positions who then have to get out of these huge positions. And sometimes all, you know, that's, that, that's in tandem with other funds doing similar things. That puts a lot of pressure on, on how you're going to achieve your goal. So let's take a look at it. First example. So scenario one. You're tasked to buy this, this million shares. The stock is NVIDIA. It's back in uh, 2016. And this is what the chart is looking like. And your boss walks to the room and says, you have to buy a million shares of the stock. You say, okay, what am I going to do here? And well, luckily now we're going to walk into a weak market. So the, the, the S&P is going to start falling. You'll see, so the, the, the stock price is down here and this up here represents the S&P 500. So you can just kind of keep that in mind, compare the two of them. So that prior chart left off right here where you started your job. And so as the weak market came in, the best thing for you can do is say, wow, I don't, you know, my goal is really to accumulate this million shares. It's not like most individual investors where, I, you know, I'm buying a stock with a tight stop. I just have to execute this million shares with the least market impact possible. So what you're going to do ideally is with a weak market, you can pick up a lot of stock and you're actually pushing that stock higher, but not dramatically higher because there's the weight of the market that's, that's, on top of you. So every time the market comes off, you buy some stock. You can see some, some of the volume swells up. You have a reversal around the 50-day moving average and you use that support area to really pick up a lot of stock, probably under the VWAP of the past several days. You have a strong rally up. And as soon as the market comes back in, <clears throat> you use that again as a great place to come and pick up some stock. So you're buying a lot of this stock over time. And you can see over this two month period, you know, your mission is, is successful, but in the process, you created strong relative strength in this market. So anyone on the outside looking in, looking at NVIDIA saying, <clears throat> we have this great story, these great fundamentals, it was a great prior uptrend, and the market is in this correction. But now this correction is ending. Ideally, we have a follow through that kicks in like we had recently this past week. And you're saying to yourself, whoa, like, look at this incredible relative strength. And if you truly try and step back and understand what's going on, the reason that relative strength happened that way is that someone took advantage of that weak market to accumulate as much stock as possible. And, you know, the right here, we have a great earnings report and it's thing gaps up and really takes off. But I would argue whenever you see this, this small uptrend in a, in a weak market, this is someone who's paying up significantly for that stock because most stocks are part of the market indexes or the stocks are uh, going to be part of uh, some kind of an algorithm selling program. You know, they're usually weighted towards the market. So big funds will be exiting uh, on a, uh, a basis relative to the market. So when you can see a stock not falling as the market is falling, that's a stock screaming to you that someone is behind the scenes who was given the same task that I just gave to you and has been buying the stock slowly over time to kind of hide his footprints the best he can and to you know accumulate that stock without impacting the stock as much as possible. And as soon as that market turns around and everyone else wants to start buying that stock, you get this liftoff phase. But you're not always given a weak market to, to work with it would be ideal for anyone trying to put on a position you have a weak market you could accumulate as much stock as you want or much more than you would in a good market but sometimes you presented a liquidity moment and you know there's the old saying is you don't get out when you want to get out you get out when you can you, you can get out or, or or vice versa and so in this example here this is back in 2010 assume you're given that same goal you have to buy this million shares of netflix and you have two months to do it how can you put on this position without impacting the stock your manager or the portfolio manager is extremely bullish. They really think the stock's about to lift off. How do you get in there without impacting the stock? Because if you're going to, if this thing trades 500,000 shares a day and you're going to have to buy a million shares over two months, you have to buy 5% of the average volume every single day. And, you know, maybe 5% doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a lot of stock. And whenever you start to step over that, you, it really starts to become obvious to everyone in the market that there's a major buyer. So you can't really go in and buy 20% of the, the, the average volume every day, you would just, everyone would front run you. So take a look at Netflix here. And here we have this gap down on earnings. And this, this institutional trader has this opportunity now to buy this large block of stock. And you can see the volume swells as you break the prior low, but you don't go much lower. And actually for a number of days, volume continues to stay, stay dramatically above average volume. Well, not dramatically, but above average volume. And there's no real downside progress despite a supposed negative earnings report and a breaking of the prior low, which, you know, most people would just say, oh, it's, the low is broken. This stock is finished. I got to get out of this thing. And that's the trader saying, whoa, I have this liquidity moment. I can pick up, I have two months to buy this million shares. I can finish this in a week if, if I, you know, at the, at the right price, because there's so many sellers. These sellers think that the Netflix story is over, but my manager is adamant. It's a bullish story. He wants me in there and he wants me to pick up the stock at, at the best price possible. And so you're, he's using these lower, these lows to, to buy all of this stock. Now, what happens is 
when once this buyer keeps buying and buying all of the stock, eventually the sellers run out. And once the high of the gap day is broken here a little bit later on, well, everyone who sold is proven wrong. So all the institutions are proven wrong. Anyone who, was, who sold because they were worried is proven wrong. Anyone who went short is proven wrong. And now the race is back on to buy the stock back. So guys who are short want to cover, people who sold and, and you know by mistake say, oh, wow, Netflix actually is going to be a, a streaming giant. I got to get back in there. And anyone who sold or, or lightened up on the position because they thought earnings maybe were negative have to reassess and maybe repurchase stock. And that is how William O'Neill's double bottom forms. And that's why William O'Neill explains that he wants the second bottom to undercut the first bottom is because that shakes out all of the weak hands. And when you have that kind of volume that comes in at that point, and you can see this is a support day on the weekly chart, that's an institution using that weakness as an opportunity to accumulate a lot of stock. So just the, the same reason why that relative strength on that NVIDIA chart formed was as a result of a buyer taking advantage of a weak market, these double bottoms form because some big investor says, whoa, I know once that low gets broken, a, a whole bunch of sellers are gonna come to this market. That's gonna be my opportunity to buy up as much stock as I can. And as soon as that stock is all purchased, you, you flip the other way and usually it's a fast move. So there's another uh, interesting example we can look at here, pins. So again, you're tasked, you gotta buy your million shares, you got two months to do it. The stock just recently gapped up on earnings. Everybody loves this stock. It's a, ready to go to the moon. How do you pick up your stock without just blasting this thing higher? Well, it's not an easy task. And actually, this is kind of an old trick a floor trader showed me when I started working there. But basically, every time this is about to break out, you want to snuff that momentum ignition. You want to prevent every trader in the world from rushing in, buying the stock and lifting it to the moon. And so every time you're about to break out, if you've already bought 500,000 shares or, or 200,000 shares, well, instead of buying more on the breakout, you're going to sell into that a little bit just to cool everybody off so you're not stuck paying dramatically higher prices. And you can see that kind of keeps us in a range for a period of time. We break the highs, they flip it lower. We break the highs, they flip it lower. And actually here, you can see the prior low was broken and you know to kind of test supply. And there's no real sellers. Even though the low is broken, the stock is on stays on very low volume. And it just kind of turns back up on the day and and... There's one last attempt here where it tries to break out, it's forced back lower, but then after from there, we finally rock it higher. And how do we know this is not just a stock that's stalling? You know, so this is why you really need to bring all of your tools together to really understand what's going on here in this stock, what is happening. So there are all these, these fake breakouts, but when you flip over to the weekly chart, this is what Bill O'Neill calls tight trading. During that entire period, although you had all these little fake breakouts to the upside, which you can see with these little spikes, which breakout traders are going to be completely frustrated with. You can see on the weekly chart, this stock is basically closing at the same price every week for, what is that here, maybe seven, almost two months. So that's that that two-month trader who says, well, I'm going to sell into strength. I'm going to cool off that ignition a little bit, that momentum from taking off. But as soon as this cools off, I'm going to pick up as much stock as I can from everybody who was stopped out of their position, and I'm going to try to accumulate that stock. So all of these patterns... All these patterns occur because there's this demand and supply going on in the background and you want to read what's happening that's why bill says tight trading is such a bullish thing because that's the footprint of an institution accumulating stock consistently over a period of time now if they've been buying consistently for five six or seven weeks uh, the odds are all the sellers are, are eventually going to get worn out and if this breaks to the upside that's when you get your very powerful move which is eventually what happened here so i just want to set the stage here with this interesting exercise. And, and I really recommend that whenever you're looking at a stock chart or, or you're, it's the weekend and you're thinking over your strategy, you're thinking over your tools, put yourself in the position of the different traders, the short, very short-term trader guys, you know, the, the institutions picking up stock. There's uh, ETFs who are just, you know, buying stock to mimic the index. All of these flows are gonna have an impact as to how the stock is gonna react in different market situations. Now, all these, these chart patterns present a visual representation of demand and supply. And what's good about that is if we can assess what the different market participants are doing, we can form a hypothesis and we can determine where we're wrong. And now when you can figure out when you're wrong, that's how you can control your risk. If you're buying a stock because you think it's a good stock, how do you know when you're wrong? And, and the whole point, even Bill O'Neill says this, it's one of the quotes I always keep with me is, you know, the big secret to this business is, is, you know, being wrong the least possible when you're wrong, you're losing the amount, the least amount when you're wrong. 
And that really is the key. You want to limit those losses. But how do you limit those losses if you don't have a way to figure out when you're wrong? And that's why when you kind of break down the demand and supply and you can say, oh, I think this is what's going on. It's being accumulated. And you can tell clearly where that is no longer true. That's when you can say, oh, okay, if, if it does break to this point there, you know, on the chart or, or if, if some kind of volume turnaround happens, I'll know that my idea is wrong. That gives you a lot of power. It gives you the ability to really um, manage your trade and exit at a logical point rather than just selling for any old reason. Now, a lot of, a lot of these ideas permeated throughout all of William O'Neill's book. Now, you can tell I've read this book, I don't know how many times, even when I was a market maker and I was a day trader and I was trading, I don't know, 200 times a day and, and, and trading one minute charts, five minute charts and order flow. I would constantly, you know, reread Bill's book and, and I wasn't, you know, the cup and handles weren't helping me at that point when that was my job because I mean, those, those are longer term and they don't really show up the same way on an intraday chart. But I always try to understand the logic. What's he doing? What's he thinking? Why is he approaching it that way? And, and all of his tools are built that way. If you go through that book, there's just so many tidbits in there. And one of them, I want to bring up the follow through day because this just happened uh, this week. And the idea of the follow through day, I'm sure most people are familiar, this is the IBD Boston uh, meetup group. So everyone's familiar with IBD's work is Bill won't count a follow through day in the first three days. Now, why? Why wouldn't he do that? And the reason is the first three days is typically short covering, people kind of just jumping back on the bandwagon for, you know, for momentum thing that the bottom is in. And it doesn't really show that there's something more significant happening. And this is an example of 2008 into 2009, the financial crisis. And I want to show this chart here where the bottom panel here just shows the daily percentage change on the day. So whether the index was up or down, what amount on the day. So you can see here, for example, this bar here was up probably about six or 7% on the day. That's just what this is uh, visualizing on the bottom. And the point I want to make, if you look at all the biggest spikes, the, all the biggest upside days, they all occurred on the, the day after the low or the day after that. So basically, and this is the allure of why so many people get caught buying into downtrends because the biggest up days always happen in a downtrend. It doesn't mean they're sustainable and it doesn't mean it's something you should be chasing. But it's very alluring when you say, whoa, look at that big turnaround. The market's up so huge. I knew I should have bought that market. Next time, I'm not going to sell. I'm going to stay in the stock because that's where these biggest turnups happen. Because, again, everyone probably exaggerates their short selling. They have to cover back. Uh, everyone panics at the same time. There's a short-term flush. Now, all these people say, whoa, I, I sold my stock you know, too early. I got to buy it back. What was I thinking? It didn't make any sense. All the value buyers come in and they soak up some stock and they add a little fuel to the fire. So when you have these quick drops down, it causes these very quick pops up. But the whole logic behind the follow through day was Bill's trying to analyze demand and supply. And is it institutions, are they coming back for real to the market? Are they coming back to really buy stock? Now, you can't clearly see that in the first two or three days because that's just naturally because of the psychology of human beings and the way you know auction markets work and, and the way uh, all this comes together, the biggest updates are in that first day or two. So it's too fuzzy. There's not enough information there. It's probably just short covering. And maybe it's a big turnaround, but there's just gonna be too many false signals. So what Bill says, he says, you know, I'm gonna wait for day four or later. Now, this is after the 2008 crash. The, the chart continues here into 2009. And you can see, whereas in the other chart, you had all these kind of spikes at the bottom uh, uh, on the low, the low day of the move or the first day up, these classic follow through days all happen more than four days off of the bottom. And so, in, 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 whereas in the past, the other market, it, they weren't, the buyers weren't able to continue that buying. They were kind of sold into right away or sellers came into the market. The follow through day did its job here and it signaled that the buying is continuing past the first three days into the fourth, fifth or sixth day. And it's 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 large. It's above uh, one and a quarter percent or one and a half percent with increasing volume. There's substantial buyers coming into the market, and it's not just short covering. It's not just dip buyers. This is real buying coming in even a week after the bottom was put in. So there's something substantial, and that kind of thinking only comes to you when you're really thinking about what's going on in the dynamics of the marketplace. And what's beautiful about that is. You can assess very quickly if you're wrong. That's why there's all those stats where IBD has, has looked at uh, if the low of the fall through day is broken within so many days, what's the failure rate, or or at least once the low of the the rally is broken, they know for sure you're back into a correction mode because the assumption that that there's institutional buyers coming back into the market is wrong. It's been proven wrong. You know, it's like it's like science. You know, you you have an idea, you, you've gone back, you see it's worked before. Now, if that low is broken, 
you know your idea is wrong. So it's easy for you to get out, reassess, and go back to the drawing board. And that's how you limit your risk. So all of the patterns I, I use all have that same logic underpinning them. And I really want to start off putting you in the shoes of an institutional trader and, and working through this. So you can, this is really going to help you take that next step higher in your education as an investor when you start to think this way. Now, I always like to go back to this when I make some presentations, because especially after a year like last year, you're going to get, you know, everyone talking about, you know, to the moon and, and there's going to be a million rocket emojis on Twitter and everything is just so good. Can't we just buy a good stock and hold it? I mean, why do we have to be so technical? I mean, so many people just, you know, everyone just bought Apple, right, 20 years ago and held on to it and everyone's the multimillionaire. Why do we have to just, you know, why do we, why do we have to go through all of this? Well, to be very honest, you know, if you look at a lot of uh, examples, look at Fastly, which climbed Fastly. And I know this from experience. This is one of the major winners I had last year uh, in the championship. But, you know, Fastly didn't stay very strong for very long. And very quickly, you're down 75%. And I'll tell you, because I know, again, from experience, I was buying as we broke out of this kind of cup with handle pattern here. And nobody wanted to buy the stock. It was April 2020. The world was coming to an end. And uh, if we're in the market, was in a big bear market. Everybody was talking about Fastly, though, when it was up here. I, I remember getting a CNBC alert on my app saying, you know, Fastly was one of the movers of the day. And I remember telling myself, oh, well, that's not a good sign when CNBC is talking about it. And, and you, know, you know, soon after some bad news came out and we, we really crashed lower. So buying a good stock is not the solution. And, and this is Fastly, which kind of ended quickly, but take a look at BlackBerry. So I'm Canadian and this was the king of Canada. It was the biggest, it was the biggest company in Canada. It eclipsed the Royal Bank, which is traditionally our biggest company. And this was up 10,500% in just a few years. 10,000, what a phenomenal move. Now the iPhone came out and I remember having these conversations with people, some people saying, oh, the BlackBerry is better, there's better security, I like the keyboard, the physical keyboard is so nice. Imagine today having that same kind of discussion, maybe some people still like it, but I don't think anyone would give up their iPhone just for a physical keyboard. But at the time, no one was buying this at $1.39 at the end of the tech cr uh, cr crash. I mean, tech was hated, and who wants technology anymore? It's been falling for two years, and the stocks are down 99%. But I I'll tell you, and I hope my wife's not listening to this, but my mother-in-law is still holding on to BlackBerry, even though years later, you're sitting with this 96% loss if you bought it when everyone was talking about it. So no good stock is a good stock. And again, Bill O'Neill says every stock is bad unless it goes up in price. So just buying a stock because it's good, because the growth numbers are good or the prospects are good just doesn't work. And here's another example here where, you know, BlackBerry, there was a competitor that came into the market. So people can argue, oh, you should have bought Apple instead. Well, this is canopy growth. So um, a couple of years ago, marijuana was finally legalized in Canada and all the Canadian marijuana producers went into these huge bull markets and the 5,500 percent, just a couple of years. No competitors came to the market. Canopy growth is still the largest, uh, you know, a player in that marketplace. Uh, however, if you walked in, this actually topped the week that they legalized it. So very standard sell on the news type of situation. So if you said, you know, honey, we got to buy this stock because, I mean, this is, this is green green fields here, and pun intended, where, you know, the stock can only go higher from here. It's legalized. I mean, they're going to be selling so much of this marijuana. It's a can't-miss situation. The stock's up 5,500%. It's going to keep going up. Well, very quickly, you're down 85% on your position. So clearly, buying a good stock doesn't exist in the marketplace, at least not in my experience. Now, this is what every single professional is concerned about. Professionals want to make money, but they're always, number one, worried about protecting their capital. Whether you're trading your own capital, whether you're trading bank capital, if you want to get fired quickly, take a big drawdown, you'll be kicked out the door. Because if you look at Fastly, that 75% loss requires 300% to get back to even. Your 85% loss in canopy growth requires 567% to get back to even. And your 96% loss in BlackBerry requires a 2,400% gain to get back to even. And that doesn't happen very often. I've, it's never happened to me once to have a 2,400% gain. So uh, it's, that's why it's so important that you keep this in mind at all times. And lasting success in my period really requires risk control. Even before we get to the buy points, I always want to really emphasize this because so many people are always so concerned with buy points because you know that's where you make your money, buying at the right time. That's true, but keeping your money requires risk control. Now, this is the asymmetry of losses. So the, the greater your losses, the substantially higher the amount of money you have to make back to get back to even. So you can see here a 10% loss. Let's say your account is then down 10%. If you have an 11% gain, you're back to even. Even if you're down 20%, a 25% gain, you're back to even. 
Whenever things start to get past 20% for me in my, in my experience, that's when I really need to put the brakes on and figure out what the heck is going wrong. Because now you're starting to get to the point where this asymmetry of losses is really going to work against you. So, you know, a 40% loss, you need 67% gain. And at a 60% loss, you need 150% gain uh, to come back into your account. And I remember when I first started investing, I know John in the introduction you know, mentioned I, I bought Wendy's when I was seven. I, I did actually. It was, it was through my parents' account. It was in trust to me. And I, I bought five shares. But I really started to get really um, after I, I read Bill's book. I started to read. I started to trade futures and commodities because you know I learned technical analysis. And as a 18 year old guy, when you learn that in the futures market, you only have to put five percent margin down, and they, they're going to lend you all of this money. It's really appealing to a guy who's you know uh, saved up his money at McDonald's and really wants to transform this into uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. But although I had some some really like stunning successes for that age, I always gave it all back. I mean, I went up like a rocket and then I crashed like a rocket because. I didn't understand this asymmetry of losses and and it was so frustrating the first the first time it happened you say oh i'll just go back there and i'll do it again and then when you realize that maybe you're kind of a little bit in the right place at the right time when you made the money in the first place now the markets have gotten a lot harder kind of what happened in 2021 after 2020 you realize wow you know trying to make that three four hundred percent return is is very difficult if you're not in the right market environment and i wish i wouldn't have given back you know, all of those gains, because now it's so hard to make those gains back. And so to to build your account over time, to keep consistently making money in the marketplace every year, or even if sometimes you have a bad year, if you look back after three years, five years, to always be pushing forward, pushing forward, that really requires risk control and not letting the asymmetry of losses getting out, getting out of hand. That is one of the real key components, and that's really what every single pro really focuses on. So again, if buying a good stock is out of the question, what could we do? And the secret is controlling your risk and the ability to identify when you are wrong. And so the solution I brought to the table is tactical buying patterns. This is where I kind of deviate away from what Bill uh, does in his book. And it's, this is as a result of all of my years of, of short-term trading and, and using so many of these short-term patterns, you know, I came to the, the realization that I would see these institutions buying the stock for weeks and weeks. And it was just like Bill spoke about, it, and I saw it in real time. And so this really came home to me. And at one point, I, I remember thinking to myself, well, why am I so concerned about buying, about buying a stock just at the right buy point? There's not one buy point. There, you know, I, it was kind of funny. Like when I'd be trying to apply the CanSlim system, I'd be always trying to find that, that perfect buy point. But then in my day-to-day -day work, my day-to-day -day trading, I'd be buying and selling all over the place. I'd be constantly buying and selling and have all my different techniques. And it's just kind of like my mind was mentally locked and saying, you know, cancel them system is what you do. And in my day trade is what I do. And I never really merged the two of them. And then at a certain point I said, well, what, why, why, why can't, if the institution keeps buying over time, why can't I do the same thing? Of course, when, when the right situations occur. And so I decided to use tactical buying patterns. Now, just for you to visualize what I'm talking about, this is an example of Seed Limited from 2020. You had your cup with handle here that formed, and, and this is the stock that really took off here after the COVID crash. It's still climbing to this day. But all these purple arrows, these are all different kind of patterns I, I, I teach about in my course and all these different swing patterns. These are all potential buy points that you had on the right side of this base. So why do you have to buy only at one point? Uh, and, and I don't anymore. And, and, and there's a lot of, there are many pros to doing it this way. So it, one, one thing that I like about it is that it really maximizes the risk to reward that I, that I can have and I can survive on a lower than expected win rate because my, my losses are smaller than that 7% or 8% that Bill talks about. I mean, you can have some of these small patterns and you know very quickly if you're wrong. I mean, sometimes on a gap up, if the gap fails, you know you're wrong. Sure, it takes more management, active management but if you really want to maximize your returns and limit your risk, there's opportunities to use these patterns to do that. One of the big things for me is having these additional buy points. And you know, two of the biggest mistakes an investor can make is losing too much when you're wrong. And the second big mistake is missing out on a major winner, a significant winner, just because you missed your one buy point. So to me, I, I remember I had missed a couple of winners for that reason, it just became unacceptable. And that's when I started to get me thinking through all this process. And so having these different buy points, it, it got to the point where I don't, I, I insist on buying through different buy points and I call it position building. And so I, I always know what percentage of my account I want to develop a trade into or a, a position into. And I'm going to systematically buy that position with a number of, of purchases over a two, three week period as the stock rounds out its base or provides all these different tech, tactical buy patterns. And that number one allows you to get into the market, into this winner, you know, a lot more likely that you're going to get into this winner. 
it, it will minimize your slippage and your liquidity impact. I mean, sometimes these stocks can be a little bit thinner. And if you want to go in there with a full position, you're going to cause some slippage in the marketplace, depending on your account size. Or also if, or, or even if your account size is smaller, but you're going above a really obvious prior high and everybody's rushing at the same time. I mean, how many times does this happen? You rush in, buy the stock at the buy point, flips over and fails. Well, you know, it doesn't take a, a, a genius to see that everyone's going to be running in above that prior high. And again, we're buying above that high because it's breaking out. It's confirming that this move may be starting. But at the same time, every algo, every high frequency trading system out there knows that this rush of buying is going to come in. It's very easy to flip the stock and force you out of your position. So if you're buying stocks over multiple purchases and you're using different types of patterns rather than obvious breakout points, you can really minimize your slippage and your liquidity impact. And also these patterns, because they're shorter term in nature, they're designed for immediacy. So when I buy one of these patterns, this stock should react right away within the next two, three, four days, or I know I'm wrong. Because they're shorter term in nature, uh, that, that allows me to take my capital, reallocate it somewhere else, or just take my capital, stay in cash and, and let things clear up a little bit. So there's a lot of real pros to using these tactical buy patterns. I think the only negative aspect to it is it can promote overtrading uh, because now you're looking at all these different buy patterns and there's all these there's all these different stocks so it really you know it's going to get you excited and want to basically you know it's like they say to uh to, to a hammer everything looks like, like a nail and so you really want to be able to control yourself and i have rules for that as well and, and how i limit this but what but there's there are just so many pros to using this approach that if you can control yourself and, and develop this into your system uh, then it really provides all these added benefits. Now, what I did was I kind of took all of the patterns, I, I studied all of them, I categorized them. And just like in the pins example and the Netflix example and the NVIDIA example that we spoke about earlier on, you know, markets don't always move in the same way. There, there are different components that are always pushing and pulling. There's, there's buyers that are trying to get in. There's the market, which may be adding gasoline to the fire and pushing the stock up quicker. It could be the market is weak and it's pushing the stock down while the buyer is trying to push the stock up and you get these positive relative strength situations. There's just all these different variations and they're all basically different variations of how demand and supply are, are, are working together. And so essentially I, I kind of took all of my different patterns and I found they fit into four different categories. Coil patterns where basically a period of time where volatility continues to di diminish as the pattern develops. There's breakouts where obviously, you know, stocks break out, they run and it's very obvious what that is. Pullbacks, you know, you want to be buying pullbacks, but you want to be buying them in a certain way. You don't want to just be a buy the dip investor and then you're finally stuck with this stock that fails and breaks significantly lower. So you want to buy pullbacks in a controlled way and expectation breakers. That's kind of the category where that Netflix example would fit in where the stock breaks down. It's supposed to fall, but it doesn't fall and it flips the other way. Everyone's expectation is broken and the stock goes the other way. Now, I know some people this year, I try and I try and answer the questions before they come up because I've, I've had, you know, different investors bring these questions up to me. Do I really need all these buying patterns? Can I just pick, look, I'm just a, I'm just a buyer of flags. You know, every time I see a flag, I buy flags. That's the only thing I focus on. Well, you know, the market has different phases. And so if you only focus on one type of pattern, you're not going to be effective in all different types of market environments and you're going to miss out on a lot of opportunities. So let's take a look at breakouts and market phases. So I think breakouts are the most common buying pattern. I mean, most of Bill's patterns are, are breakouts in nature, whether it's a flat base or a cup with handle. Um, so let's take a look at breakouts. It's the most obvious, simple to understand. You're breaking a prior high. How does this work at different points in time? So here we're looking at Chipotle Mexican Grill back in 2010. This is another stock that I actually traded back then. And you see, you have this kind of this cup with handle here and this really, you know, strong overhead resistance. This breaks out and just runs away. It's up 69% in three months. This is what everyone who buys breakouts, everyone who wants to buy growth stocks, that's what everybody wants. That's, that's the dream. That's what 2020 provided. But the reality is, is, if this is a whole market cycle, you know, this dream could very quickly turn into a nightmare where every time this breaks out, boom, you hit with a 14% drop. You break out very quickly, 14% drop. You break out 10% drop. Now, what happened? It breakout, it's not that the breakout concept isn't valid, but breakouts, in my experience, work best early in the market cycle. And there's a very strong reason for that. You can see here, Chipotle Mexican Grill was showing that relative strength. Look, as the market was coming down, this stock was, was working its way higher here throughout this entire pattern. There was somebody accumulating. There was someone, like in that NVIDIA example, it was a big institutional investor buying stock consistently day after day after day after day. 
And when that market pressure came off, there were no more sellers. There was no one to come in and stall that stock. That buyer, you know, that buyer either finished or, or, or wanted to more quickly finish up his buying. Everyone who sold it has to figure it out. Oh, wow, this thing's under accumulation. I have to get back in. And you break out and there's no test of the breakout. It's beautiful. After that, you know, the stock has, has matured. It's on people's radar. The market has been strong. You know, when this breaks out, there's a lot of people sitting with significant profits. They're saying, wow, I'm back in my highs. You know, <clears throat> when this stock stalled here and, and came down, there's a lot of people will say like, oh, if I can just get back to the highs, I'm going to get out of this stock. Or there's going to be a lot of algos or high frequency trader, trader uh, you know, uh, companies will say, wow, when, once this breaks out, we're going to sell into that to shake out every breakout buyer. And it's easier for them to shake out the breakout buyers here because it, it's weaker hands at this point. The person who was buying, the institution that was buying during this market correction, this is a strong hand. This is someone who wants that stock. Even a weak market is not slowing them down from accumulating that stock. However, someone who's buying this breakout here, this is someone who's chasing a breakout, who wants that same quick move. It's very, they're a weak hand. And institutions, algos, short-term traders, market makers, they know that and they can very quickly push them out of the market. And that's why you get these, this, this constant evolving failures of breakouts. And just about the time you're so fed up saying that I'm never gonna do a breakout again, market corrects and boom, all the breakouts start to work again. And this happens in different situations. This is Dexcom. It was, uh, this is, uh, was, was a leader for quite a few years. Same example, we had a really weak market. Look at this kind of break lower here. And this stock was kind of being accumulated throughout that entire phase. So this is a stock that is in very strong hands and this breakout breaks out and never tests that breakout. Anyone who bought that breakout, bang, you're right away, you're right into the profit and you're never tested. It's beautiful and you don't really have some very quick profits. From that point on, this is where the pain comes in. So it's not, it's no longer just strong hands that are in the stock and every breakout, you fail. You break out, you come in. You break out, you come in. Uh, here you break out, you don't really fail, but you go sideways for a period of time. And then way up here when it's really obvious, you break out and they kind of crash the stock. They break out, they crash the stock. And so this is, if you don't understand what's going on behind the scenes, if you don't understand the elements of relative strength and, and all of these different patterns, and you're just saying, I'm just a one trick pony where I'm buying breakouts and I'm buying breakouts, well, that's fine, it will work, but then you have to be astute enough to know when to use it and when not to use it. If you can't make that determination, then one pattern alone is not gonna help you. Another example here is Shopify. You can see we had a, a weak market here as this pattern was forming. So this was into strong hands. And when this broke out, very strong initial move without ever testing your breakout. As the trend matures, exact same scenario, every, every breakout is met with a sell-off and it's just, it's very frustrating to the, to, the, um, to the holder. So the point of this part of the presentation is to really say you wanna have all these different, these different buying methodologies. That's why I broke them down to four different categories. That's why Bill has his different uh, patterns, his double bottoms, cup with handle. He doesn't have just a cup with handle. You don't know how your stock is gonna form. And if, if you're just using one type of approach, uh, chances are you're not going to make money long term because you're going to have a really great stretch. Then you're going to get confident and you're going to be confident just about the time that your, your approach is not going to work anymore. And you're just going to give back all of your profits and frustration. Just one last example here is uh, we can look at Shopify again in 2020. Similar thing broke out very strong after the COVID crash. And then every other kind of breakout kind of failed and stalled on you. So how can we, ca can, can we control our risk, capitalize on these opportunities and I would say with tactical buying patterns, we can avoid the obvious breakouts and use failed breakouts to our advantage. So when, once you can understand the demand and supply, and you can really start to break these patterns down into different categories, you can study them and find alternate buy points that just make a lot of sense. They're logical and they're not obvious to everyone else out there. So coil patterns, I like to call these really, you know, it's volatility that's contracting breakouts because it's unless you're, you're looking for them you're not going to notice them because everyone's looking at the prior high but the entry is typically earlier on in the pattern where the volatility starts to expand out of the pattern and this is these are one of my favorite ones to use because the fact that the volatility is contracting usually means that if you're wrong you're going to know relatively quickly and with the volatility small the, the the range of the bars of each day is, is quite a bit smaller you know after stocks had this this big breakout one of the most frustrating things is the stock has this big breakout and now you're looking at the you know the bar and you say wow well i know the breakout will fail when we take out yesterday's low but yesterday's low is nine percent lower and i don't want to sit there with a nine percent loss well with coil patterns because they've been coiling 
you know relatively quickly that you're wrong and the volatility of the pattern is, is very much controlled. So the mini coil is, is one of my favorite patterns. And quite simply, you can see here is, is you have one kind of usually, usually it's a, a larger range bar, but then the next two days are, are live within the range of that first bar. So the next two days never take out the high of that, that bar and never take out the low of that bar. So what's going on here? So typically you have this, this day's range and buyers and sellers can't get control either way. And, and I remember when I'd be, you know, day trading, that would really be just a quiet period where you can tell there's nothing going on. If it was under accumulation, you can kind of feel like the buyer stepped away for a couple of days. Sometimes, you know, buyers will do that to see if, if you know, if there's any, if, are they the only ones really holding up the stock or, or is there anyone else buying there along, you know, alongside with them? It's a way for them to assess what their competition is doing with that specific stock. But the good thing about this is that if you break above this first range high of this bar, you know really quickly if you're wrong. If you break out the high and you kind of flip over and fail and, and take out the low of the, the prior day, you know very quickly when you're wrong. And I call these hidden breakouts because you can see they don't have to always happen at you know a prior high point. They can happen be, before. And um, that's exactly what happened with Roku here. We kind of gap right out of this pattern. And very quickly, you have five times your risk. And to me, that, that times your risk, the amount of times your risk is a very important concept because every time you're risking a dollar, you don't want to be trying to make a dollar. You want to make at least $5 for every dollar you risk. So at least that's the way I approach markets when I, when I uh, look at them. And so let's take a look at some other examples. Chipotle Mexican Grill. So everyone's familiar. This was really um, one of the hot, you know, hot uh, restaurant chains back in 2010. It's still growing very strongly. But I just want to point out here, there's an article I found online just saying about how, you know, last year the company had added 129 stores. They were looking to add 145 by the end of 2011. They saw record level profit margins. So just like Bill always talks about, it's not a secret which stocks are going to go higher. It's, it's the stocks that are already showing tremendous growth are most likely to be your next winners. So I just want to show how this kind of, this works with the can slim approach. It's just a, an alternate way of doing your buying. So if you look at the, at the Chipotle chart, if you were running in to buy these breakouts and you know, if you view this as a cup with no handle or this is a cup with no handle or you know, however you were interpreting this, you were, you were stalling out all these different points and it was very frustrating, but you had these mini coils in all of these different locations that gave you these great entries that nobody's really paying attention to. So you can see here, I, I kind of, uh, blew up the pattern up here so it'd be easier to look at. So you had this first big green bar. And in this case, you had three bars that went sideways. And you know we broke out on the fifth bar and you have this very quick move higher. Now, not every move is gonna, that every time you use one of these patterns, you can have this monumental move. Here, for example, we ran up to the old highs, we rolled over and you came all the way back down. I mean, my, I know myself the way I am. If I was sitting with that kind of a profit, I wouldn't be taking a loss on it after all of that. But that's not really the point of this pattern is that, you know, uh, this example is that here you can sell, instead of buying and, and losing money immediately, here you have a chance where you could have made some good money. I mean, here you have to zoom out, see what were the markets doing. You know, was there a lot of, you know, negative action that maybe you would have been selling your stock into strength, you know, uh, for a shorter term profit if the market was in a correction? I don't know. But you can see here is, and I, I remember at the tail end of 2011 to 2012, the, you know, the, the market did take off and you had these great two buy points that were less obvious to everyone else. You were able to get in at a better price with a very small risk. You can see here, we had this red bar right here, two bars that went sideways within the pattern. And then this day here, we kind of kick higher, break out of the pattern and you start your run. As we break the prior highs here, you can see we kind of have this stalling period, but that actually just forms another mini coil where you have this big red candle you have three bars that live within it. And on the fourth day, you break out. And then you have this really strong, steady uptrend. And you were able to buy two positions into this stock with very limited risk. Uh, you had an immediate move out of the pattern and you weren't buying it with everybody else. And it's just, that's really important is that, you know, you don't, you want to be looking for places to get in where everybody else is not looking. And this is a great pattern that I really like. This is pins again. So I know we looked at all that frustration in pins earlier where, you know, they kind of kept breaking higher and coming in, breaking higher and coming in. And, and you know, these are substantial corrections. I mean, it's not, we're not talking about a three or 4% correction. These are 15% corrections, 18% corrections. I mean, even if you're giving yourself a 7% stop, you're going to be stopped out of this. And the frustration is to look back at this stock and say, I bought the stock three times, I lost three times, and then the stock doubled or more. And that's probably the most frustrating thing that could happen in the market. But if you take that same period of time and you look at a different way to enter your stock rather than the obvious uh, breakout buy points, 
Well, you had a mini coil right here. You can see you had this first range bar. You had three bars went sideways. We break higher. It almost stopped you out, but it didn't actually quite stop you out. It came close. Sometimes you get lucky that way and, and just gets close to your point, but doesn't knock you out. And from there, we started to move substantially higher. We had another mini coil right here, right before earnings. We broke higher and we gapped up. We did have a mini coil in this area here, which this, this you know, is an example of a failure. We broke out and we, we fell over, but at least you know relatively quickly that you're wrong. I mean, once you break out here, look how small the range of these bars are. Once you broke out, your, your risk was, was very tiny. And so you didn't have to expose a lot of your capital. You definitely didn't have to wait seven or 8%. And after we went sideways a little bit longer, and now keep in mind pins when we looked at the example you saw on the weekly chart where you had six or seven weeks of the stock closing tightly so you knew it was under accumulation this should have been on your watch list especially since you're trending up nicely and the numbers are fantastic and it was really benefiting from the stay at home story we had another mini coil here and we broke higher and although there was some kind of like stalling action here if you bought way down here you were still safe and you weren't stopped out when this kind of market got a little bit wonky here as it took out the prior high and so this really pro provided you with these alternate entries within this very strong uptrend. So instead of buying those breakouts, you could have used your mini coil. So that was an example of one of the patterns that I use for volatility contraction. Another pattern I wanted to bring, uh, bring up just to kind of stay on trend with what we've been talking about today are these pullback patterns and, and avoid the crowd. And I'll be honest, I really, I kind of uh, created this pattern or I guess found it or, or studied it or however you want to categorize it. I basically found this pattern that we're gonna talk about out of frustration of being stopped out in canceling stocks at these breakouts. I went back and I, I studied all my mistakes and said, what is going on here? And I realized a lot of the times, you know, once you have this breakout, even though you get stopped out and you fail, like you did in that pins example, if you're looking at these stocks that have this phenomenal earnings growth, sales growth, everything is there, the stocks can end up going up without you. And I can't tell you how many times I isolated these great companies, but just wasn't along for the ride because I messed up the, the, you know, the, the technical buying of it and actually lost money because you're stopped out only to see it go higher without you. So I went back to study my mistakes and I, I realized that a lot of this, you know, this, that's when it started, started to click that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the techniques I was using short term on other people, these institutions were using on me with the cancelling system. And so I call this the, the failed breakout pullback where essentially once we break out of a pattern, if the stock stalls within the first couple of days and, and pulls back to that 20 day average, that 20 day average is where I'm going to buy my stock. So I rarely, rarely ever buy a stock above a very obvious prior high. Like, so you see, this is the prior high. It's very obvious. The only time I'll really look to do that is if I have a very low cost and I'm just adding a little bit to my position and my average cost will, will stay significantly lower. So a, a pullback at the highs won't bother me. Or I'll do that after a big market downtrend because the stocks are so sold out. Like I mentioned, the stock is all in weak, in, in strong hands at that point, like in that early NVIDIA example. So a breakout is more likely to work. Once we, we go past the, uh, you know, the, the bear market or the significant pullbacks in the marketplace, the breakouts are just so prone to failure. I either want to be in earlier in the stock, either through a trend line break or one of the many other patterns that I use and talk about. Or what I want to do is if we had this very quick breakout of the highs, I'm gonna wait for it. If this thing just rockets off, I'll have to buy it somewhere else. But typically I'll I'll wanna buy this as soon as it touches the 20 day moving average. And you can see here, this broke out, fell 7%. Again, 7%, I, I don't think that's a, a number by luck. That's probably because a lot of people end up selling at the seven or 8% because of Bill's system. And that's where these shakeouts end. And we touched that 20, week, 20 day moving average and we kind of slingshot higher 27% in 27 days. So very strong move after that. And if we look at here, again, this is that same Netflix example as before, just how when you start to learn all these different patterns and how they all work together, there's multiple places you can buy. So I mentioned there was that expectation breaker down here, which it's a specific pattern, but there's no time for that pattern today. But we broke the prior highs. After only three days, we stalled and we broke lower and we got to that 20 day average. And that was just the perfect place to buy before you really had this strong move higher. Now, I remember I bought this stock. This is one of the first real monster stocks that I made big money on. And I was also, you know, using my account at the bank um, when I was pro trading to, to, to use some can slim. I had to talk to my manager about that uh, style shift, but he, he gave me the go ahead. And luckily I started off with such a great pick, but uh, I remember this buy point here, this, this middle of the W was $124 and 10 cents. I still have that, that number locked in my head. And when this broke out, I remember being saying, Oh, wow, I caught this monster winner. When this came down, I was like within, I think pennies of selling my stock, saying my stop's going to get hit. And, and luckily it turned around. 
and and we moved higher but just to say I remember looking at that and saying like, oh, wow. And that's, and, and it just, it was kind of like bit by bit after years of seeing these failed breakouts and these pullbacks, I finally realized I got to use this to my advantage instead of being the guy, you know, getting caught and, and, and being sold out all the time. Like, looking back, if I would have bought the breakout rather than the double bottom, that difference would have meant that I would have been sold out by the time we got to that 20 days because I bought it a little bit earlier with a double bottom entry that was less obvious to most that I survived it because this drop was a 15% drop. And this stock went out to be a major winner. If you were stopped out right here, that would have been an extreme frustration. Peloton is a very sim uh, similar example. This broke out last year. And because this was so straight up off the bottom, if you bought above the high, I mean, like, look at this stock. If you look from this low point here to the, it's basically from the bottom straight up to the right. It's kind of hard to not make money in this stock. But if you would have bought above the prior high, that was one of the few really bad places to buy the stock. And this thing instantly fell over 23%, enough to pretty much wipe out anyone who has any kind of stop in the marketplace. And it stopped right on the 21-day moving average. And we flipped up and it turned into a major, major winner. So the right point was to buy was on that pullback after the breakout failed. Now, I really want to use this again. What are we looking? What are we studying? What's the demand and supply? So the 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 idea behind this is that the stock is strong. It has great earnings, it has great fundamentals. This is not a stock I would short at the highs just because I think it might fail. I'm not, my mind is I'm trying to find a, a big winner. This has all the attributes of being a big winner, but a lot of people are probably gonna be forced out and, and are gonna have to sell once the stock stalls at a prior high. And I wanna be taking advantage of that and buying on the 20 day average. And as a result, I want the stock to break the prior high and stall within three or four days. So if you in the the Netflix example, this stalled within three days and rolled over. In the um, Dexcom example here, we stalled within three days and rolled over. So I'm not talking about a pullback that happens three weeks later. I'm talking about this thing breaks out after two or three days, we roll over and start to head back to the 20 average. It's a classic stalled breakout, probably going to pull back. And that's when I want to buy it on the 20 day average. Now, the way I work it in terms of risk is I put a simple, because here I, unlike a mini coil where you can tell where the pattern is going to fail, here my, my, you know, my hypothesis is that 20 days is going to be what's going to hold the stock. It's the, just typically where I look back at where it stops after these kind of failed moves. So I give it a 5% stop, but you have, you have a really high likelihood of the stock really rocking and rolling right away off that 20 day average. So that's how I like to use this pattern. Take a look at Okta, perfect example. We break above a prior high flip over right away down to that 21 day you just ping it and then you have this rocket ship higher if you were you know sold out here you'd be really frustrated now this is in 2018 and i just love to show this example here i remember when i was looking for examples to explain this and i found this at all oh, wow perfect this is octa one year later in 2019 same stock same flat base broke out by one day and you came down to that 20 day average so this is when you come back and you look and I say, what's going on? This is not by happenstance. This is somebody that says, I'm going to sell into that. And, and, and you know, most most pros, a lot of pros, will focus on a couple of stocks. That's their that's their their go to stock. They trade every day. Can slim traders are a little more unique in that they're applying a strategy and that they seek out different companies. A lot of pros will just focus on the same companies and just you know get to know them very very well. And that's that's actually how I traded at the bank for a number of years. I'd be five stocks. I would just trade those five stocks every day, all day, and be a, you know, probably 30, 40% of their volume on those stocks. And so, you know, the, the same person that broke the stock out last year, slammed it down to the 20, is probably the same person who did it a year later, because it's the exact same pattern, exact same technique, and it led to this really strong move higher. And so that's my uh, overview of the different tactical patterns, um, why we have to try and avoid those obvious buy points. Uh, John mentioned earlier that I put a course together and I, this is just a snippet of what I really I cover and, and really it's um, this kind of thinking is what is what permeates the entire course and, and I, I hope everyone really liked my presentation and um, I'd be glad to take any questions. Hey, thanks, Matt. This is an outstanding presentation. I was just mentioning in the chat that, you know, in Bill's book, How to Make Money in Stocks, he, he outlays, you know, a lot of concepts and framework. Um, but what Will, what Bill doesn't do sometimes is explain, you know, the why behind a double bottom, the why behind, you know, Bill says, be willing to buy back a stock if it quickly recovers. And I think your presentation is just really outstanding uh, because it starts to show the why. And that's really what, because this is how institutions 
think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously institutions drive the market. And um, so I think it's, it, your presentation is just a great connection between some of Bill's teachings in the actual reality of institutions driving the market. Um, so, yeah, we do have a lot of good questions in the chat. Um, I know that Victor was trying to aggregate some some themes. Um, Victor, do you yes, have a couple uh, things you want to put on the table? Uh, sure, I'm ready. And uh, Matt, fantastic presentation. I was trying to uh, consolidate all the questions from the chat. I definitely need to go back <laughs> and, and review your presentation. There are just so many nuggets from chart reading and everything. It's it's really, really great. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I appreciate that. <clears throat> so um, the questions relate, and I'm, I'm going to start with more like philosophical questions mm -hmm. uh, or general, and then we're going to dive in a little bit. So uh, some folks noted in your charts, you use a lot more price than price volume, which, of course, a lot of us here are pure disciples of uh, William O'Neill, and he always stresses the volume. So how do you incorporate volume in your chart reading? So I absolutely use volume very often. So one thing I didn't go in today is, is all of these different tactical patterns. I really use them within the system that Bill built. So I, I won't take these patterns just anywhere. I want to buy them within uh, some of Bill's bases. I call them shapers because I, you know, I, one thing I, I find everyone calls, you know, Bill's bases, bases, but bases is such a generic term. He has really precise types of bases he looks at in terms of dimensions and time. And so I, I use these in and around those. If it gets too extended from a base, even Bill says, if you get you know, 10, 15% above, it's, it's too extended. And, and I really back off from my buying as well. So the way I use volume is when I interpret those bases, I do that week by week action or, or day by day action. And I, I try and figure out if they're buying or selling going on. And the only time I really use volume in terms of the actual breakout day is if I'm buying a breakout. So the reason that volume, in my opinion, surges on a breakout day is that when you're at this prior high, and I see this all the time, you know, it was a lot more obvious before HFTs and algos came in. And I remember I used to be there and there'd be, let's say, you know, 500,000 shares offered at, uh, I don't know, $22. And, uh, you know, I, I remember I'd be on the desk and be other guys next to me saying, oh, wow, there's, that's a lot of stock. And you just slowly see it getting eaten away at 500,000 before 50, 425, 390. And, you know, the rule we would have is if you saw 500,000 shares, you want to buy that last, let's say, 100, 125,000 shares. So, so all, all the someone else does all the the hard buying where the risk is high, and you're the last guy to get the last bit, and then it explodes higher. So the reason that volume swells on this breakout is that there's been this big buyer there, but someone finally steps up and says, "I'll take everything, bang!" And if he comes back with more stock to sell, I'll take that too, and the stock keeps going. And so that that seller that's been suppressing that stock, that the seller that has created the top of that base is finally fully consumed. And so all that volume is, is eaten up and we break higher, but that doesn't always happen on the smaller pattern. So if, if there's this coil pattern or this like there's this pullback to the 20 day average, I don't need this volume surge on this pullback to the 20 day average. That's not logically what's going on within this pattern. So that's why the volume is so key on a breakout. But if you're using these alternate patterns that less people are paying attention to, uh, then the volume is not as, as critical as on the actual buy day the volume, the way I use it and the way I interpret it and teach it is that you really want to use that to assess from the weekly charts and, and how the stock's been acting. Is there is there net accumulation going on or not? And so if you think there's net accumulation and then you're using one of these patterns, the volume is just important in building the picture, the mosaic as to whether or not it's a stock under accumulation. So right. that's my long-winded that, actually... long that, long answer to a simple question. No, no, this is, this is great. Actually, kind of a great segue in, in another question we had and something you alluded to in your slides, sneaky sneaky buying versus sneaky distribution. Um, how do you distinguish that? And how does that, that's actually an ad for me personally, are you looking at those signals as the stock is close to the short-term moving averages? Uh, I don't know, can you, can you rephrase that, that question just a little bit, Victor? I'm not 100% I'm not yeah, so sure. Sneaky, yeah, you talked about sneaky buying and, and distribution. Right. So how do you distinguish that yeah, I, th I think I think one of the, the ways I, I really like to do about it is really relative strength. So, mm. you know, it's it's really these people putting on big stock. It's always relative to the index. And I use the S&P, even though I trade mostly NASDAQ stocks and the NASDAQ is the index that I use to tell the health of the market because that best represents the stocks I follow. 
Uh, the S&P 500 is the big daddy. That's what everyone is benchmarked against. So the S&P 500 is, is really in terms of relative strength, how I, where, how I use relative strength. And so if you see a, a really rip roaring market and the market's really strong and every time your stock kind of breaks highs, it, it flips back down. Uh, to me, that's probably someone's trying to distribute stock. So you want to put yourself, how is the stock acting relative to the index? That's kind of what helps me to distinguish whether or not there's someone trying to, to buy, you know, at an opportune time or whether they're trying to sell at an opportune time. It's really how this, the stock reacts to the, uh, to the index. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, with regards to, uh, and you started your presentation talking about some stocks breaking down uh, below 50. We, I think this year has been very actively <laughs> happening uh, when a lot of stocks uh, like NET, uh, in particular, is the one that got me when it broke mm -hmm. down below the 50 in huge volume um, and then kind of reversed and kissed me on the cheek and went off into the blue skies. <laughs> how do you how do you handle it from the standpoint of what are you looking for on the chart? And I'm going to ask you a psychological follow up to that. How do you force yourself in, in, into getting into a stock that just shook you out on a volume? Yeah, so I, there's actually a pattern I, I really specifically designed for, for just such an occasion because it's happened to me and, and like I alluded to it in the Netflix example. Mm. And so really when when there's no follow through on the downside after a bad break like that, it, it's it's really a fake out. So I mean, and, and it's hard. I mean, it doesn't mean you were wrong in selling the stock because right. I mean, when you break down, you have to get out. But that doesn't mean you can't buy it back either. And, and the only way to really make that that mental leap and that's really difficult. Um, well, actually, you know, I have the opposite problem. Like I, I, sometimes I, when I really like a stock, I think it's the conviction you have on the company and the overall weekly picture of, of how the stock's been acting technically. So mm -hmm. to, to be able to make these kind of moves, you really need to understand the, mar the, the stock. It's very difficult. I mean, it, it, most people who are purely technical in nature, they're not going to be buying a stock back like that. They're just technical and they're looking for the same kind of pattern. To, you know, to have a stock represent a big percentage of your account and you just took a big hit, you sold out and see it flip back higher, you got to really understand that stock. You got to really want to be back in that stock and you have to have an objective way to do it. So it's not easy. That's probably one of the hardest things to do is to make that kind of turnaround. And, um, yeah. and sometimes it, it's, it's the wrong thing to do too, because sometimes I've been guilty of I'm shaking out of a stock. I say, oh man, now it's really going to keep going. And I jump back in a little bit too early, you know, and then after it really, the, the break was a real break. Like I mean, the net examples, it's not a typical example of what happens. It's frustrating, but I mean, to see a stock break down and after go up, what is it, like 60, 70%, like in three weeks. I mean, like you could have basically just bought it where you sold it and made the same money that would have taken you months prior to do it, you know, in a couple of weeks. It's, it's, a, it's an abnormal situation. Usually it happens on a much less uh, dramatic scale, but um, it's really about having those expectation type patterns. And that's something that most people don't talk about, but having those expectation breakers can be a powerful tool in your, in your tool. You know, another, another uh, technique, uh, we're talking about these kind of gap downs that occur on really high volume that um, you know, I use is, you know, when you see a really big high volume day with a gap down, and the stock closes, you know, your expectation is, okay, this looks really bad. This thing is going lower. And watching the stock around that kind of high volume close is really important because if it only just kind of drifts a little bit lower and the volume starts to dry up and it just kind of drifts sideways or slightly lower, it's telling you maybe there isn't high volume coming on the downside where institutions are just you know, running for the doors. And sometimes, like you said, uh, the recovery of that high volume day does become an entry point because you say there is no downside follow through. And then as the stock starts to reverse, big investors come back in and use it as a buying opportunity. It's something to look for. You know, these are like, these are complex discussions. And, and that's, I think, where people, when they first start learning chart patterns, a lot of people dismiss them. I mean, when I when I first started trading, I was young and I, I really fell in love with technical analysis. Like in the early 2000s, everyone in the stock market was a fundamental base. There weren't many technical people. I mean, now I think with algos and HFTs, it's you know dominating order flow. I think it's a little more accepted that there is something to this technical analysis. Um, but really, most people who come to the market say, oh, what's a couple of everything's a head and shoulders or it's a this and, and you know, like a sloppy analysis, a two minute analysis of a chart. Is, is not going to be what's going to get you record breaking numbers or triple digit return. It's a hard business and it's a hard business. And that's why the most people fail because they come in and they do a sloppy job. It's like tomorrow I say, I'm going to be a painter. I never painted, but just give me some colors. I'll draw something and I'll be a Picasso. It, it doesn't work that way. Like 
it's the same tools anyone can use them but it's that understanding that minute details and what's going on like what you described john and really focusing on on you know what's happening here that's the difference between someone who makes money over time and the 95 percent of the people that get frustrated and just then say i'll buy and hold and they never come back to it i, I think yeah, that's, that's, really that's a great difference. that's a great great point and, and, and bill actually emphasizes that he says when you're looking at even when you're looking at you know bases cup with handles etc he says analyze each bar yeah especially on a weekly chart he says actually go through what's happening week by week by week and each bar of that chart to determine is the stock under accumulation is it under distribution and it, it actually is faking you out there's more distribution in the chart and bill talks about that a lot and you know, in this world of um, instant gratification, mm -hmm. people skip over these steps and they say, oh, I see a cup with handle and it's viable and they don't really take the time. You have to analyze the base carefully to really understand are the odds in your favor? Because that's what this is about, yeah. putting the odds in your favor. And Bill emphasizes that. And it's a step that, you know, don't skip over because, you know, if a base is under distribution and it breaks out, it's likely to reverse. Yeah, and I think that's why there's no kind of shortcut where, you know, he has his hundred charts at the beginning of his book. And a lot of people say, oh yeah, it looks, they all look like cup of handles. But no, you want to sit down and really look at each stock. And, and actually I'm looking forward. I know you're working on, on a, a model book of uh, from 2003. And, and I, I just love having these examples. I can't wait to see it. I love having all these examples of stock after stock chart. And my wife thinks I'm crazy. When I go on vacation, I bring charts with me. I was just like, yeah, I don't maybe I try to do real time trading. I try and control myself, but uh, I, I like a pastime of mine is to look at these past winners and just see like what's going on. And, and I always, always try and put myself in the shoes of what's going on with the market at that time and what I'd be doing. Because if you just look at a chart by itself, it's kind of like uh, paper trading. It's almost useless. Like, I mean, I, I, a lot of people like to paper trade. 95% of what's hard about investing is all the emotions that you go through. So, and, and same thing, when you're studying these charts, if you just look at a, a chart pattern in and of itself, that won't tell you a lot. You know, it's one thing to, to say, oh, yeah, I would have bought that stock. But if you're sitting there and uh, bad news comes out with a trade war and the Dow just dropped uh, 3% and are you, are you going to say like, oh, yeah, I ended up being a support day, don't worry. In, in real time, it's difficult. So you want to look at those support weeks, say, would I have been shaken out? How did it do? How did it close versus the market? And so that detailed information that really makes a difference. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, guys. So I, I have a, another 300 pick the questions. I'm going to go line by line. With each I'll one. go a little quicker on my answers or else we won't get together. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I'll go a little quicker. No, no, I, I'm just kidding. But I'll really a phenomenal number of responses on the chat. And uh, so, uh, Matt, as, as you know, we just had the FTD on, on, uh, on the mar in the market and yeah. everybody is, is questioning, okay, so the follow through day happened. And when I look at the leading stocks, they're all super extended, UPSD, yeah. um, you know, uh, and, and a number of NET and a few others. They're just so far away from anything. Getting into the leaders is extremely risky right now. Mm -hmm. How do you position yourself when we are, let's say, in, in turbulent waters in the market? Uh, IBD is um, saying that this is a market correction or market is in correction. How do you uh, position yourself in anticipation of the follow through day? So the way I use a follow through day and market and correction, instead of using it as a kind of a, a black and white type of thing, because I've, you know, you live this long enough, you see it all. There's situations like this where it actually can work against you in, 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 in a sense. So I really use it as a, a throttle as to how aggressive I can be. So if we're in a correction or I use another tool besides distribution days, I use net highs, net lows. It's a little more, uh, I think, a little simpler to to use. When we're when we're in a negative scenario, to, what I what I do is I just say basically, look, I can't be on margin. I need to have at least a thirty or forty percent cash position, and the stocks that I do buy, you know, I have to be out very quickly if they fail. So I it, I just use it as a way to throttle my exposure. So if you do it that way, you won't get too hurt if things do keep falling. You're going to be forced out. I think the real pain is when you're in this corrective mode. And you go in heavy, bang, I buy a bunch, of, and then and the market falls over and burns you. You say, oof, I just lost 5% of my account. Then you do it again, oof, I lost 4% of my account. Those big dramatic in and out moves, like I showed in the follow through the example, the big moves happen off the low. So people who chase in after those big moves in a bad market will get killed. So what I do is I really use the correction as a throttle saying, look, I can have some exposure. If upstart, like for example, and that's why I was talking about on IBD Live, that thing wasn't budging. You went up like 100 something percent, the market fell over and you didn't even budge. I mean, if you didn't have if you did if you didn't have exposure, 
that's one you could have put some exposure on. Doesn't mean you got to be 150% invested. You could have had 15% of your account invested and have it all in upstart. That's a way. So I use it more in terms of how aggressive I should be and how much cash exposure I should keep. Yeah, kind of another thing that John and I remind ourselves daily, or mainly John is reminding me, not the other way around, mm -hmm. is that if this is a true market uptrend, there's going to be plenty of yeah. stocks that are going to break out uh, a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later. So I think it goes all the way back to the psychology of each and every one of us uh, not to chase the stocks. FOMO is bad for you and everybody else and just give it give it a chance to come to you and suck you into the market. Yeah, and that FOMO I think is, is the worst enemy. It's, it's one I fight, you know, I struggle with all the time. And that's why I built all these different patterns. So, you know, again, if the high tide flag was your only way to buy upstart, I mean, there was a mini coil prior to the breakout yeah. that you could have used if you go back to that chart that, that like I just described. If you have these different patterns, you can now look for that pullback, look for different ways. So that's why it's good to preemptively have different ways to get into these stocks. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. And um, so in your regular average everyday routine, uh, how do you go about establishing your watch list and modifying it? I'm sure your watch list, like everybody else's here uh, over the course of this year, has been burned a couple of times. Yeah. Well, I, I just have my list of scans that I'll run. And I, I just, what I really try and do is I, I try and I end up with a list of usually 100, 150 names out of, of decent looking stocks. But then I'll always boil it down to maybe 20 or 25 where I say these are stocks that I want to own I mean we have earnings at record highs or we have if there's no earnings sometimes there's no earnings in the story it's a sales type of story like a software company we have these this, you know it's rock and sales you know and and the relative strength is there like there's those key criteria of record numbers relative strength that is always the precedent of every major winner so I always boil down to the you know say Matt you can only have 20 stocks in the market right now which one are they going to be I make a list of those 20 stocks and then instead of chasing stocks all over the place. I'm always trying to go to these 20 stocks to find a way in. And so really simply, it's just a matter of running the scans every weekend, but then going through this process of stock by stock. And if the stock is not making record earnings or ah, the sales are not great, is it going to be in my top 20? Probably not. So I'll just put it aside and I kind of have like a checkout list and I have my top priority list. That's the way I kind of run it. Gotcha. And uh, with respect to the moving averages, um, what, what do you use every day and how do you assess the position of the stock on the daily chart and weekly chart? So I use different averages for different reasons. I use a three day exponential. I use that for, for really short term. Like when I just get into a stock, I use that as a way to, uh, you know, as having been a really short term trader for a lot of years, I'm tempted often to like sell a stock if it doesn't go up immediately. So I use that as a way to control myself. I use an eight day exponential instead of the, the 10 day simple, which many people use just as a uh, kind of a shorter term gauge of trend to see how extended I am on the short term. The 20 day is, is normal for most uptrends, unless we're going to go into a bigger correction. The 20 day is usually a point of where we stop or a point where it shouldn't get too extended from. And the 50 day to me is really um, the most important average. It's more important than the 200. The 200 for me is just kind of, I won't buy anything below a 200. It's kind of general cutoff. But besides that, I don't really like to play with stocks around a 200. To me, really the 50 is is where my stocks live and breathe. So everything is really... Uh, it's the, the 50 day is the only average I'll use in isolation to make a purchase. The other the other averages are just used for other purposes, but the 50 day to me is is a, a core average. And do you use any other uh, oscillators? And there's so I, many know, tools I, out there, it's just confusing, if anything. Yeah, it can get confusing. I, I think if you're more of a swing trader, there's some great tools, and there's there's tools that I used to like really live by, like you know Keltner channels. Uh, there's a, some a couple of few tools I've modified myself, which I do use, but. When I talk about this approach, like you, that's why you just want to be careful what approach you're using. So if, if, if I'm swing trading or I'm saying, look, I'm going to go for a period of time where I'm going to be actively swing trading, I'll use some of those oscillators or bands in, in certain ways. But when I'm using a canceling based system, you know, my, my focus is really on price and volume. And, and I'm, my mindset is really not focused on catching a swing in the market. My focus is on catching a major winner. So the, the shorter term technical indicators have less importance. So it really, it, it's not that they're no good. It just, it, it just depends on what you're doing. So for years I lived off of them and now they're just not important to me in the same way. Gotcha. I have a question Thanks. for you, Matt, and this yeah. relates to uh, pullback buying. Um, you know, one of the things that's, I think, essential to pullback buying is you really have to have an uptrend quote in place. Yeah. So the pullbacks are within the context of, a, of a, an established uptrend. What would you use to determine that that stock truly is in an uptrend? 
So I, I don't buy pullbacks very often for that reason, because it's so easy to get sucked into like this concept of being, you know, buying into a downtrend or whatever. So usually the, the two places I usually use pullbacks are after a big gap up. So, I mean, if you're gapping up to new highs, you're definitely in an uptrend and I'll look for a pullback after that, or I'll, I'll look for a pullback after a breakout of a base. So, I mean, clearly we broke out of the base. We, we made new high, usually it's 52 week highs or at least a multi-month high. And then after I'm buying a pullback there. So those are really the two cases that I'm using uh, pullback buys, but I, I'm never buying a stock in a pullback if it's below my 50 or below my 200. So if, if you look at those two scenarios, either a gap up or a, a breakout failure, by definition, you're going to be above your averages, right? So uh, that's how I use them because it's, it's so easy to get sucked into trying to buy pullbacks and then you're stuck with a bunch of losers in the down market. Matt, does uh, the market cap and average dollar volume uh, of trading in any particular issue is of any concern to you? It is uh, I, I market cap. I usually try and limit it like $2 billion and up. I, I like to live in the realm. Like personally, I'm usually most, I think it's a, it's a personal preference because the volatility is usually goes hand in hand with the market cap I found. So these really small caps can be crazy and, and the big caps can be a little slower. So I, I like mid cap. So usually I'm looking at stocks that are like four or 5 billion, three, 4 billion up to maybe 20 billion. I still feel like I can get a double or triple out of them. Like sometimes it's a good looking stock, like a Tesla, for example, but at $800 billion, I mean, even if it becomes the world's largest company and you, you double up to almost a 1.6 or a 1.8 trillion, uh, you have a double maximum. I mean, it's, it, at a certain point, it just becomes so hard to move a big number. So I try and stay, you know, sub $100 billion, but I also try and avoid these two, three, $400 million market caps. I did for many years trade them, but if, you're, if I'm trying to be concentrated and hold for longer term moves, again, you want to be where institutions are going. They're not typically buying $200 million companies. So... Uh, my, my, my preferences are mid caps that eventually hopefully grow into almost large caps. Understood. Great. Thank Mark, you. Uh, Matt, here's a, here's a general question. And I know, I know you're an avid uh, watcher of the fed yeah. um, in terms of the big picture context of market moves. Can, can you just share, I mean, obviously you see where we are, we, you know, we are in the second year of a bull market. The fed is, um, you know, talking about, tapering and rate cuts, rate increases probably in 2022. Can you just share your, uh, you know, overall big picture, what you're seeing right now, where we are in the bull cycle and the Fed actions? That's my biggest worry. That's why I've been cautious is because the Fed's talking taper. I don't think, I mean, uh, I think anyone here, a logical person looks around us saying that the world's half shut down and how we're in this big bull market doesn't make any sense. It's only because of the Federal Reserve. Uh, so I watched them really closely. So them tapering is a big concern of mine. I think it, it really depends on how aggressive they get. I've noticed that sometimes when they make only one move, and I know Jay Powell has, has adamantly said, we're not gonna, we don't want to taper tantrum like in 2011, where they kind of stopped QE very quickly and everything fell out of bed. So I know they're cognizant of that. So usually trouble shows up when they make a few moves. So two, three moves in terms of tightening, but it's something I'm watching really quickly. Like if I see the Fed starts to taper and I see sell signals come out, I'm going to be really quick to get out of the market because that's where these, these market corrections come in. If you look at, Every market correction, except you know, COVID recently, it's always kind of Fed related, rate related, uh, and so that's what's something I'm really paying attention to. That 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 tapering is a significant thing, and no one really talks about it. But to me, that's my main worry. Yeah, uh, Matt. One last question, sure. uh, and it's 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 a, unfortunately it's, it's a little big, um, and maybe you want to go back to one of your slides. With regards to the mini coil, I think you spent a few slides talking about it. Can you um, just walk through again uh, your uh, uh, how you assess that? What are you looking for? Price, volume? That would be sure. greatly appreciated. Yeah. So basically, the mini coil is just you know one of the, the first book I got was uh, technical, technical analysis of stock trends by Edwards and McGee, the 1948 classic. And you know they they would always draw all these pennants and these triangles, and and basically those are all coil patterns where. You know, the pattern starts and it progressively gets tighter and tighter. And that's what a mini coil is. You have this initial bar and the next two days or more all live within this first bar's range. So now in short term, you can say, look, if it breaks the lower range, I can short. If it breaks the upper range, I can go long because my whole system is geared towards finding these monster winners. And I'm, I'm really primarily looking just to work, use these to the long side. So essentially you have a stock that's that's basing has all the right criteria. You're in this case here, we're right on the right side of a cup and handle within the handle phase or just after the handle broke out and paused. And this gives me a point in time where you can see, you also typically see it in the volume, you have a breakout day that pauses and you have two days where the volume just really dries up and the stock price action stays stuck within this first day's range. 
And that allows you to really say, look, if we break out of this range to the upside on a short-term basis, we're going to get momentum ignition. Now that short-term momentum ignition tied with the bigger picture can often give you this really small risk that turns into this big winner. And so if we look at, at another example for, um, I say Chipotle, same thing here, th this, this mini coil at the end, you had this, this down candle here and the next three bars all lived within that first day's range. So if you, if you were to zoom into a five minute chart, let's say, you'll just see like, you know, you have this, this big towering down wave and then everything's just stuck sideways and the bulls aren't taking control. The bears aren't taking control. So when someone finally pops his head above that range, you know, either it fails immediately or you have everyone rush in and saying, okay, that seller is done. Boom. And we start to go to the upside. And because the pattern is only a two or three or four day pattern, your risk is so small compared to if you're using a seven or 8% stop. So that's the idea. Basically, the, the volatility is coiling over a, a number of days. You can typically see like here, you actually can even draw like trend, an upward trend line on the mm -hmm. bottom and a downward trend line on the upside. It's not always so well defined, but that's really what's going on. And here, if you look at this example here, this goes back to also like we were talking about a breakdown. Like this first bar here broke the 50-day moving average. And then you got two days that just go sideways. And then after, boom, we gap up, and we take out the high. So everyone, you know, kind of broke down, went nowhere for two days. Everyone's looking around the room saying, hey, are, are we going to sell this thing? Are we going to buy this thing? And all of a sudden, someone makes a decision, we break higher. And they don't all work. But the, the beauty is when you work, you can make a lot of money because you have this winning stock. And when you're wrong, you got a very tight stop. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's all an odds business here. So it's not prediction. So if, if I can make $5 when I'm right and lose one when I'm wrong, over, over a year or two, you'll end up profitable. Gotcha. And how do you scale in uh, into a position? How do you pyramid into a position here? using that coil, mini coil. So again, I, I really, I don't really put a preference over my patterns. Like I, I have like about three or four patterns in each category that are my go-tos. If any of those show up, I'll use them as a buy point. I just, I just really use them within the range of, of one of Bill's uh, general patterns. So I, I, if it's more than 10% above the pattern or 15%, I won't take the, the, the buys anymore. And also I won't take it below a, a 50 day average. Really, really my, my ideal, point to buy is to scale in on the, as the right side forms and as relative strength is mm. showing up. So um, I, I try and keep some space between my buys because I like to be concentrated. I'll usually have maybe a third of my account in a position. I'll, I'll buy, let's say 10% of my account exposure at each buy point. And that allows me to build up with a controlled average cost. And if the stock does break out and run, I got a major winner. If I make my first buy and it falls over, I only have 10% of my account in there. So it's kind of it's kind of just the market forcing me to keep adding money to what's working and just like getting rid of what's not working and being small when I'm wrong and big when I'm right. Right, and and let's say um, like a couple of stocks for me personally, I, I get up to like 70, 80% of the target position, they ran away from me. Yeah. Um, so it's not a full position. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm gonna look for the pullback. How would you, uh, handle that situation. If something just blows up on you to the upside, you're happy, but you don't have a full position. Well, I mean, it's, you know, really it's okay. Like if that happens to me, uh, that tells me I'm really right. I mean, when I can't get a full position, like something's really right going, it's when I can buy a full position too quickly, I know that there's something wrong. I mean, even Jesse Livermore in his book, Remnants the Stock Operator, I forget who's buying. I think he's talking to some guy and, and he gets his tip to buy and he, he tells the operator to sell. He says, sell, I told you to buy. He's like, I'm just testing the market. When you're in the, it's the same principles that happened back then. They still occur today. So if you can't buy your stock, that's the market telling you, wow, you're bang on this thing. So look, if this stock's in a double or triple, if you're not a swing trader, if you're a position trader, this is going to touch a 10 day average or a 20 day average somewhere. And if you bought it and you have 75% of your position and you're up 30% in, in a week, so you buy that last quarter of your position out of place, your average cost will still be so low, you, you won't be hurt, you know? So that's, that's the way I, the first chance I get to, uh, either a pullback to an average, or if I get a sideways consolidation, I, I'll wait for one of those two things to occur. But as soon as they occur, even if I'm extended from the base, because it proved to be such a winner, I'm gonna buy it even extended. Gotcha. And promise, last question. Uh, let's say something is not going your way. What is your stop on a mini coil? Is it the intraday low? So I'll, I'll use two places. It usually depends. Uh, it depends like uh, how much we kind of gap up or what the ranges of the bars are. So either, you know, if like in this case here, we kind of gapped up and broke out the high. So because we have this gap up, it's also like a kicker pattern I talk about. So basically if, if we took out the close of the prior day, so if we go from being up to being negative on the day, I mean, we've really failed. I mean, like we, the stock is up three, 4%, we're breaking out, then all of a sudden we're negative on the day, I'm out. Sometimes if the stock does break out properly, 
you know, the close of the prior day is not as significant as it is on the same day. So I'll default to the low of the prior day, as long as it's, it's a reasonable basis, a, a reasonable point. Again, it's like, there's no real super black and white. You wanna make an assessment of what's going on. And I usually use the close of the prior day or the low, depending on my risk tolerance, how wide the, the bars ranges are to get a, a general sense of how it's acting versus the market. But those are the two points I'll do, either the close of the prior day or the low of the prior day. And that's how I, I do it. Depends how aggressive and a trader you are. All of these patterns, when you understand what's going on, you can kind of always tweak them according to your personality a little bit. So uh, that, that's, the, that's what I would recommend. Matt, thank you so much. Uh, I, I can't even begin to thank you. This is, this is great. I'm definitely going to rewatch that video and uh, take some, some interesting notes. So many nuggets. Uh, really fantastic presentation.